Hi, my name is Tom Johnson, and you're listening to a podcast from I'dRatherBeWriting.com. Now, today is a little bit different. Usually, my blog is about technical writing and API documentation and tech comm topics. But I was recently reading a book that I thought would be good to review. It's called Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. We were actually reading this as part of a uh, automotive and transportation book club that I have going at work. And so the gist of this book is that the Dutch have achieved tremendous success with cycling in cities. They've got a lot of infrastructure huge numbers of of people actually biking to work what did they do to achieve all that success how did they how did they do it and what can we learn and maybe implement to have similar success it's a great premise for a book and uh it's kind of written in the style of journalistic articles the authors interview a lot of people um they live over in the netherlands in in uh uh, I think various cities or maybe they live in one city and they visit a lot of different cities, but they're definitely over in the Netherlands and they're kind of learning firsthand from the people and how, how people had success over there. In reading this, I wanted more concrete takeaways. So I listed out 12 things that I really got from this book and I've got a blog post that already lists out kind of the details of, of those uh, takeaways. In this podcast, I want to put a personal touch on this. I want to kind of, kind of uh, tell a little personal experiences and anecdotes related to these topics. So let's jump into the first one. <clears throat> uh Embrace e-bikes to replace more car trips and attract new demographics to cycling. Now, this is this is my phrasing of the takeaway. And uh, I've got some images here from Dolly just as visual decoration. They're not part of the book, although the book has many excellent images. But this is just, uh, you know, sp spun up from Dolly's imagination here. But on the topic of e-bikes, um, the author says that, that basically e-bikes are kind of becoming a huge percentage of the new bikes sold. Something like 50 or more percent of new bikes in the Netherlands are e-bikes, which I find pretty fascinating because most of the pictures I see of like all the bikes in, in the Netherlands are like just pedal bikes that, uh, you know, like thousands of them parked in structures and so on. So I guess I'm kind of wrong about that. I think a lot of these must be e-bikes. Now I, I bike to work. I've been biking to work for about a decade at various places. And, um, I've always ridden a pedal bike, like a manual pedal bike. I've never had an e-bike. Um, and and in some ways I've deliberated about like, should I get an e-bike? Should I continue with my pedal bike? But that's not the deliberation that people who get e-bikes are thinking about. People who get e-bikes are often getting the e-bikes to replace a car. They're maybe getting rid of a second or third car, or in the more extreme cases, they can get rid of their primary car and go full e-bike. So Every time you pass an e-bike, don't think, oh man, they're cheating. They're not getting exercise. Why are they just, why are they just like on a little moped? Well, think of, think of their decision as choosing that form of transportation instead of a car. And all of these e-bikes is, are only going to give more, uh, support for better bike infrastructure. I really think the author's on to something about using e-bikes as, as a way to just get around in a city, in a congested city. Uh, it just seems to make sense from so many different levels. I actually, while reading this, I thought, man, I should really look into the e-bikes. My work has a cool like partnership program with Ride Panda, like an e-bike partner, and I could get a, a sort of subscription at a discount for an e-bike. So I thought, let me go try some of these out. And I went down and I test rode them for a couple of hours. Um, I test rode like a Roadster, which is a really lightweight e-bike. And then I tried a Voya, a little heavier. I tried a, a Pack Yak, which was like 
the kind that you can put a kid on the back or two kids on the back or cargo. It's like super heavy duty. Uh, I tried a Diamondback Union, you know, and I'm riding these all around and I'm like, wow, they're, they're actually vastly different from one e-bike to the next. And the higher priced e-bikes are just smoother, whereas the, the lower priced ones uh, feels more like you're pedaling a, uh, a stationary bike, like there's more resistance and so on when you're not <clears throat> actively accelerating with the e-assist. Um, but ultimately, as much as I wanted to replace my bike with an e-bike and get rid of sort of my car or fully sort of give it to one of my other kids who's commuting to school, um, I just couldn't because I, I have to pick up one of my kids from soccer a couple days a week and uh, it's late at night, about 8 p.m. The roads aren't safe. There, there aren't dedicated bike paths where I live in Renton. This is, this is a city in the southeast of Seattle, about 20, 30 minutes or 20 miles below Seattle. Um, my kid is 13, and the thought of, uh, <laughs> I asked her tonight at dinner, I said, hey, what do you think if we, what do you think if I got like a cargo bike and with a back seater and like we rode home? She was not into that at all. Like it would be the equivalent of me showing up at her school, like in my underwear or something crazy, like just, it would be, oh, that's a terrible analogy, but <laughs> like, it would be a very embarrassing sort of uh, scenario. So, um, yeah, maybe she gets her own e-bike, right? She's 13, except for, oh man, um, the thought of like a young kid on an e-bike without good biking lanes just was really, really frightening to me. So, uh, ultimately, I decided I didn't have enough use case to really go full e-bike. Um, but, uh, you know, in other scenarios, I would have easily done it. Had I not had the soccer pickup scenario, I totally would get rid of my second car. Not my car entirely because you still need it to get around places. But it would be pretty awesome to have a uh, an e-bike. All right, let me jump down to the next principle. Integrate bicycling and public transit to enable convenient multimodal journeys. And this is one of the principles I love because I personally have a multimodal journey. I, well, let me get into what the author says first. He says, a lot of people might think initially that trains and bikes are sort of competitors in, in transportation modes, but they're not. They, they build off each other and they have a synergy between them because people need to, to get to the train and then once they're at the train, they need to get to their destination. Uh, that first part is called the first mile problem. How do you get from your house to the train or bus? And maybe it's a couple miles, maybe it's longer. And then once you get to your desti once you get to the, the drop off station, how do you then get to your work destination or wherever you're finally going? That's called the last mile and bikes really solve the first mile and last mile problem pretty well. In the Netherlands, they have the system called Ove Fiets, which is like a inexpensive bike share because the trains are pretty crowded there. And I think during rush hour, they can't actually take the bikes on to many of the trains. So there needs to be a form of uh, a bike option for when people get to the the train station downtown or wherever they're going to go that last mile. Apparently you can rent a bike for like $5 and 50 cents. I was looking up at the, the current um, price. I don't know how long that is or if that's the full day or what, but um, it seems a lot less expensive than the Lime bikes in my city. Uh, if you want to rent a Lime bike in Seattle, you're looking at about $10 for 18 minutes or so. Um, and, uh, the scooter is the same. Um, they're, they're a lot of fun and I think most people don't take them regularly, but they, they use them if they're like a tourist or, or have a one-time need or recreation just for fun. Cause they're like, the scooters are so much fun to ride around. I ride around on them quite a bit actually. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so my, my trip is definitely multimodal. I drive to a train station it's an actual train, uh, although there's also a link light rail near me. But uh, the train's so much faster. It, it takes the bulk of the trip, the a good 20 miles or so, 
of travel or maybe not 20, maybe 15 or so, and gets me um, into downtown King Street Station, which is right smack downtown in Seattle. And then to get from that King Street Station to Fremont, which is where I work, um, I bike and I choose to go kind of a more scenic route. So it's like seven miles, but that's what I want. Uh, I could, I could take a quicker route for about five miles, but I like to go along the water and get some exercise in and it's really nice and scenic and the, the paths are just better. But I love having like a bike rack on the back of my car where I can combine bike and car and train or link light rail in really interesting and powerful ways. Um, uh, I've looked at so many combinations, so many combinations of these multimodal journeys. Um, the options in the Seattle area are pretty vast between buses and link light rails and sounders and where you want to park and how far you want to ride and which route you want to take. I probably explored like 20 different options and tried them out and experimented. Uh, and I, I definitely like that creativity and flexibility. I wish our bike shares were cheaper in Seattle. I kind of resent the fact that they're all e-bike options. I would really like to see a pedal, a, a, a pedal bike for $5 for the full day. I think that would be amazing. Uh, people don't need e-bike assist. I, in fact, I'm surprised people aren't, aren't killed more often on these things. Um, especially if you're a tourist and you don't know exactly where you're going, you could very easily end up on a road like third Avenue where like there aren't good uh, bike lanes or buses going super fast up and down uh, and that's kind of terrifying all right number three design infrastructure around complete trips not isolated modes now this is also a really cool idea and this connects to techcom quite a bit in the in the fact that it's a systems thinking perspective um and what the author is talking about here is that when you when you look at whether a transportation system works or not, you, you can't just look at one mode. You can't look at the bus system alone or you can't look at the train in isolation. You can't look at the bike paths in isolation. You can't look at the car paths in or car roads in isolation or the pedestrian paths in isolation because all these different modes connect to each other. And if there's like a failure in one connection point, it can make it so the other modes uh, or other legs or segments just aren't possible. Uh, for example, um, a lot of the train stations, now I'm, I'm in South Seattle, right? So uh, it's a little more spread out. There's not that many train stations, um, but a lot of the train stations don't offer parking. So if they don't offer parking, and there's not a good bike route to get to the train station, then how do you get to the train station? Do you take uh, an, an Uber or a Lyft? Do you, do you walk? Do you bike on dangerous roads? Like, it can be really problematic, even though the, the train might be great. It might be efficient and clean and safe and inexpensive. But if people can't get there, then that whole leg or that whole journey is is problematic. So if you're if you're the link light rail and you're like, why don't I have more passengers? You have to look outside of just your own transit mode. You have to look at the journey of, well, how are people getting to the link light rail? And where are people going after they get there? Are we serving a popular area and providing last mile options for people to get to wherever their final destination is. Um, and these agencies have to work with each other. You can't be siloed. Again, this is really the systems view of, of things, looking at the whole instead of just the individual parts. I had another principle that I, I really, that really resonated with me is to use social media for activism storytelling and political influence to drive cycling adoption. This is why I'm actually making this podcast. Uh, really a lot of the, the cycling cycling infrastructure requires some kind of political budget and commitment and planning and approval. And if you're not like part of that 
system that makes those decisions, then it can feel like it's very easy, easy, easy to feel powerless. But I think that's uh, not the whole story, especially now that you've got YouTube and you've got uh, blogs and social media in the form of of uh, things like Twitter and so on. You can really access the decision makers and you can um, emphasize and, and kind of help persuade by telling stories and just sharing what it's like cycling. Uh, so I, I want to do that a lot more. I feel like there's an opportunity here that I'm that I'm overlooking, especially if I have a, a blog and a presence. Um, I can I can tell this story more. Another principle that author talks about incorporating cargo bikes for efficient urban freight and delivery. Instead of having these big delivery trucks, the UPS, the, the uh, Amazon trucks, and other kind of giant delivery vehicles that are trying to maneuver down narrow, narrow city roads, they're double parking that are just like uh, endangering people on bikes or pedestrians because it's very difficult to see. Um, why not have e-assist cargo bikes that can carry 20 packages, small packages or more, uh, that can easily stop, that can deliver kind of like a bike messenger, but with a cargo bike. Um, I think that's a, it's a great idea. I don't really see too many of these. The book said that DHL is leading the charge here, but I've yet to see a sort of a loaded up cargo bike with a bunch of stuff that, that somebody is delivering. Uh, packages from uh, there's another book uh, that I was reading called parking by Henry Graybar who talked about how these delivery trucks pay thousands of dollars in fines parking fines and other kind of uh, fines just from the, the challenge of trying to get into the places they're at it's apparently a big issue another item here prototype cycling infrastructure with temporary materials to demonstrate benefits and iterate. A lot of times when people think of a safe cycling structure, they think, oh, I need a, a double path protected two-way sort of lane that's got cement barriers on the sides and so on. And while that's awesome, if you find one, <clears throat> chances are uh, that sort of infrastructure is pretty heavy duty and maybe hard to get support for. So the author says a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they'll put up temporary uh, materials such as cones or planters or little pop-ups. I'm not exactly sure what a pop-up is. I think that's where they have like a little plastic um, uh, tube that goes up that's like bolted into the, the ground uh, that you can kind of like move around or you can push down and it pops back up. I see those pretty frequently. And uh, I think these are these are great measures. Um, during the pande pandemic, a lot of streets were classified as stay healthy streets. They were they were barricaded or closed down from traffic, except for like um, only the people who lived on that street. And it was great. Like overnight, you could transform entire roads into little parklets uh, or other areas where humans could interact and and, and thrive. And when you do that, you when, when you kind of make these changes, even though they're temporary, people can get a, a better feel for the effect. They can say, wow, um, I get the vision now, or I, I see how the street can be much more than, than just a place for cars to drive along. And, and it's actually having a great effect. Like it's more lively, it's, it's attracting people, it's, it's inviting more bicyclists. I, you know, this principle is something that my wife and I have been discussing quite a bit in another context. Okay, so she wants to put a roof over our back porch because she wants to be outside more regularly. Now, normally I would be all for this, except for the roof apparently would cost $30,000 to put up there. So this is a major like financial decision. And the argument is, if you build it, uh, people will use it. And that's kind of one argument that a lot of people could make about cycling, right? Like, if you build these, these bike lanes, people will use them. 
And the reason that uh, you don't see bike bicyclists out in the streets is because there no there's no space for them, right? Well, I think this temporary prototyping can be really handy in seeing whether uh, there's there's a need and a use for the bike lane. If you put up the cones and you maybe close down some streets and make some side streets um, more more available, green streets as like an alternative bike path, um, you can see whether people are coming and using the bike lanes and, and that support can then give rise and give way to more permanent infrastructure. You can really go out and, and make the case because now you've got people there and you didn't have to spend millions of dollars building the, the fancy um, super safe cement encased structure or not cement encased, but cement barricaded on the sides or something. All right, number seven, customize your cycling plans based on a city's unique context and constraints. This is a major point the author makes. He's like, look, um, he, he actually talks about a lot of different cities in the Netherlands. And uh, I'd always just thought of like, hey, it must be great cycling anywhere in the Netherlands, but it's not, it's not the case. You've got a lot of different cities with different levels of infrastructure for, for cyclists. And he says there's no cookie cutter kind of plan that every city can automatically make. They've got different histories, different needs, maybe different transportation systems in place, different geographies. And um, you can't just go in and say, all right, everybody who wants to have great cycling infrastructure, follow these 10 plans or 10 patterns. It's all custom, which I kind of think, well, then why did you subtitle subtitle your book, The Dutch Blueprint uh, for Urban Vitality? Because a blueprint suggests some kind of like plan that can be easily repeated or that can be uh, implemented and so on. Um, at the same time, though, I applaud the author's sort of uh, recognition of complexity and you know maybe maybe the blueprint is that hey there's no exact blueprint for this it's really just like you've got to look at the history and the uniqueness and the character and make plans um, based on that um yeah all right let me keep going here number eight understand that change is hard fought and requires advocacy through grassroots campaigns and political engagement. So this is another point where I think the author is combating some myths. I think a lot of people think, well, somebody at the high up level must have thought that cycling was important and rolled out like great infrastructure across the country. And the people just were like the beneficiaries of this awesome cycling system. That's not the case at all. In fact, in post-World War II, the author explains, um, the car was really seen as a symbol of modernity and a lot of cities who were rebuilding after some, some aftermaths like Rotterdam was rebuilding after being bombed and so on. So they had the opportunity to make a lot of new streets and decisions about the shape and, the, and, and how their city uh, was. Well, they started to build Rotterdam for cars because the idea is like, hey, people are gonna drive into our city, it's gonna bring economic vitality, people are gonna shop and load up their car with things they've bought or whatever. Um, it's just gonna allow more people in and out and so on. Well, uh, what happened as people were rebuilding Rotterdam with an auto-centric paradigm is that a lot of children started to be hit and killed by cars. Something like 450 children a year were, were killed by cars, and this really alarmed a lot of the parents. <clears throat> and, and some of them started a stop child murder campaign <clears throat> that really raised awareness and ignited this issue uh, about cars as being something that was socially uh, super risky. In the 70s, there was an oil crisis that further kind of uh, jeopardized the, the whole car model, right? Like fuels, just insanely expensive. These things are dangerous. They're killing the people. And then 
to add to all this, um, as as the construction people were building roads, I believe they filled in a canal or something, and people were really having second thoughts about the impact of the automobile. Uh, so it took like people at the grassroots level coming together and saying, hey, we want something different. We want, you know, bikes and so on and pedestrians rather than just cars everywhere. The author says that a lot of times, like there was really close votes in city council meetings and, and the cycling infrastructure only passed by small, small margins. And coming back to the prototyping theme, a lot of times they, they don't go in asking for millions of dollars with fancy cycling infrastructure. Instead, they'll start pretty gradual, maybe um, de devoting some streets as green streets or side streets, uh, or maybe doing what's called traffic calming, where they they reduce the speed down to 19 miles an hour on a, on a road by maybe making it narrower or adding roundabouts or... I don't know, planters or something. However, they, they calm traffic, um, making, making it less comfortable for cars, reducing some parking, maybe taking some of that parking and converting it into some bike lanes and so on. The bike lanes maybe don't involve a straight shot from A to B, but maybe you go down some green streets and maybe some part of it is like the temporary pop-ups and only gradually do you, do you move towards more permanent uh, and and uh, safe infrastructure for cycling? This is something I really need to do more um, in terms of like advocacy. I'm really bad at this. Like I need to I need to figure out more of like the bicycle master plan in my city. I know Renton sort of has a cycling component to the their transportation plan. And uh, it would really be worthwhile if I just got more familiar with it, because as great as Seattle is for cycling, Renton is getting like a D plus if that. Um, and and they, they probably are thinking, well, you know, everybody drives. We don't have a lot of cyclists. Uh, well, it's kind of like the chicken and egg thing. You don't have a lot of cyclists because there's no safe like paths for the cyclists. You have to drive. But don't mistake the fact that people are driving for um, some kind of choice that they've made about wanting to drive instead of choose bikes or e-bikes or something. So I think if I were to make my voice more heard, I could change that narrative or help change it. All right, number nine, collect data on usage, safety, and business impact to make the case for cycling infrastructure. One of the common sort of um, uh, objections that a lot of people have to cycling infrastructure, especially at the expense of roads, is that it's going to make a strong business impact, right? If you take away the parking in front of my store and people can't drive there, then my profit is going to tank and I'll go out of business, right? Well, uh, in the studies, the author explains that in the studies that they have done about the economic impact of cycling infrastructure, it's really the opposite that happens. The businesses increase um, their 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 uh, revenue by sometimes 30, 40 percent. Um, so it's really important to collect this data in order to change the minds of people. And once people start to see that, hey, cycling isn't really uh, taking away my business, they're, they're often all for it. Now, if you think about like the reasons why it could be the case that cycling and encouraging more pedestrian zones and so on would increase a business, um, think about it like this. If you make a place more desirable for people to be, more people will desire to be in that space. Uh, if you make it more human centric, more humans will uh, collect there. And when you have more people and it's a place where people want to be, then they will spend more time and they will probably shop more and be more of a patron to your business. Now, I think this is a pretty, pretty strong argument, but uh, I think there might be some nuance to the type of businesses that thrive. I was trying to think when I go to the flagship REI downtown, if I were buying something that were hard to carry, 
would I still go down there and buy it um, if I couldn't drive there? Let's say I, w- I was going to buy a pair of skis, which would be interesting because I don't ski. But let's say I, I needed to buy a pair of skis. Well, it'd be really hard to kind of get those skis home on the bus, although probably doable. Um, or what if I what if I were planning a trip to Uijimaya? This uh, Asian grocery store that's really famous in this area. There's a flagship location. Would I go there knowing that I'm going to have like grocery bags if I, if I have, if I can't drive? Now that's a lot more difficult because like you can only buy so many groceries, right? Well, I don't know. I think there must be nuances to the type of businesses that thrive and, and those which don't. Obviously, a place like REI is used to people who uh, uh, have gone green. I bought a, a pair of boots there the other week. I, I rode a Lime scooter over. Uh, I didn't realize that they were no longer, that REI was no longer like handing out bags. And so as I was coming back home, I basically had like boots that I was uh, wedging in between the scooter platform and my foot and so on. And it's a little bit awkward um, trying to like maneuver that around. And that was just like a single purchase, right? So, so now not only, not only do you like have to carry your stuff out because you not, because there's no parking, but now imagine you don't even have a bag for it, right? Like you've really got to plan ahead. Um, At any rate, I'm glad to hear that the business impact doesn't devastate businesses. Number 10, promote urban vitality by diversifying transportation outside of, outside of cars. This is a point I actually thought was interesting. The author says that, uh, at some point in a city's growth, a city can only grow so much if it's a car centric city because cars take up space, not only the roads, but the parking and, uh, I guess gar- parking garages and so on. Just like it occupies a lot of physical space. And if you want to have like a dense urban environment where lots of people are close together and businesses and other, uh, things, parks and, uh, event centers and, and art and so on, all in this really, um, really kind of energizing way, kind of like a New York city walking down Broadway or something where you're just like visually stimulated. And there's so many like people is so diverse and it's like such an exciting place to be. If you want to have a city like that, you're not going to get there if cars are the dominant mode because cars will just take up so much space and cars and people are sort of antithetical. Uh, the, the more cars you have, the more danger it creates to pedestrians and they sort of are working at odds with each other. I think it's an interesting idea and definitely there's a lot of people who really want that, that urban vitality and downtown environment. And there's a lot of people who, really prefer to be more outside the city with more space and so on. All right. Number 11, use signature architecture and art to proclaim a vision for a cycling people for a cycling city and inspire people. So in this sample image here, there's like a very artistic bridge. That's uh, a bridge only for like cycling and walk and pedestrians. And it's clear that like you don't, need this level of, of aesthetic, uh, kind of architecture for the bridge, but it makes a statement. Now this is just like a dolly image. This is not like real. The author has some, some examples in the book that are pretty cool. For example, uh, uh, he said that one bike path had starry night, Van Gogh's starry night kind of embedded in the concrete and at night it would light up. Um, and so a lot of people would just want to ride along this. It would draw tourists and others who just wanted to experience it because it was like such a cool thing. Um, near my house, well, kind of in Tukwila, there's a centennial bridge that has always sort of baffled me because it's like, it goes over a little tiny canal, but it's this, uh, it's this 
big old bridge. It's definitely oversized for like the level of need. I'm used to just like having much simpler bridges, but this one is, is kind of huge, right? And it's making a statement. I think it's trying to celebrate something. Um, and I, I guess in some ways I'm like, yes, hats off to your ability to celebrate uh, this bridge for for people on foot and on bike and so on in a, in a more kind of magnificent way. On the other hand, I'm like, gosh, it seems overkill. Uh, surely there's better use of, of funding for like more cycling infrastructure. At any rate, um, the author says a lot of cities are trying to send a message that, hey, we're not a car centric city. We are a cycling first city. We really want like the tech elites, apparently a lot of, a lot of like people who work in tech, they, they want a bike. They, they don't really want a car centric city. And this is a way to kind of uh, bring people to that city and send a message. It also attracts a lot of tourists. As I said, uh, definitely if you've got, and, and that's not a small sort of industry, people who want to bike around and see the city and see all these cool like things to see is definitely a lot of fun. On my way home, uh, during the route I take, there's actually a really cool part where uh, it's not anything the city did, but somebody made some awesome graffiti underneath a bridge, and I love going by it. It's this huge mural, this like face and some other stuff, and it's just cool. Like It feels pretty awesome going by it, because I'm like riding right through art. Um, I'll, I'll try to post a picture of it in the show notes. Um, and I think murals, the author mentioned mentions murals as like a, a good technique as well. And, and I definitely like that um, in the rides that I have when I can pass through interesting, colorful murals. It really celebrates art and uh, makes the, the journey just more enjoyable. All right, last point here. Emphasize practical bike designs that are optimized for urban mobility over recreation or sport. Now this one, I saved the best for last. Um, the author talks about how Dutch bikes, they're pretty utilitarian. They uh, have their, you sit upright. Apparently almost nobody in the, the Netherlands wears a helmet because um, they're so upright. If they fall, their head is the last thing that's gonna hit the pavement. Something like 0.5% of people apparently wear helmets, but they have very, very, low numbers of head injuries. Uh, the bikes often have coaster brakes. That's where you, you pedal backwards to stop. This frees up your hand. You've got, you've got like cargo racks on the front and the back to put your bag and your groceries and your other things. You got fenders and you've got, um, chain guards. And, uh, I think he even mentioned a skirt guard, which I don't even know what that is, but obviously to keep your skirt from getting pulled into the tire well and so on the wheel well and the bikes are just really sturdy they're made of like aluminum or steel and they're they're built to to withstand a lot of uh just so uh, adverse weather and other conditions now i have a specialized cirrus it's like a commuter bike it's not a fancy gravel bike it's not a road bike it's not a mountain bike it's kind of like a hybrid and um i had I had these clip in pedals, uh, that I was experimenting with, um, the clip in pedals are the kind where you have to have the special shoes with the metal cleat and you like put your, your shoe in, into the pedal and it locks in so that you can like pull up. And I, I got these because I like have some killer Hills, uh, near my house. It's 500 feet of elevation climb. If I ride all the way home and, uh, I wanted to like pull up. Well, First of all, it didn't really do a whole lot for me, um, like in terms of climbing the hill. But I also started to think that like, this is just the wrong design because now I have to wear special shoes with like a metal cleat on the bottom that sometimes goes crunch as I'm walking. Um, and I have to have like different shoes at work and different shoes at home and just like changing between them was way too much hassle. Um, and so I actually, uh, uh, took off my pedals. Um, in, in doing so, I managed to like strip my cranks because I didn't have the right tools. Uh, it was just a dumb move and I had to replace my cranks. Um, 
Fortunately, just a small plug, there's a great used bike store in Seattle called Recycled Cycles, very clever name. They have a ton of like very inexpensive used parts. I was able to get some used cranks, put them back in, popped in some normal pedals that don't require the clip-ins, and I've been very happy. And it doesn't really make a difference climbing hills. What makes a difference climbing hills, obvious, or, or uh, what makes a real difference climbing hills is having these like little pull bar, pull up bars. I'm not really sure what they're called, but they, they extend kind of upward from the ends of your handlebars for like five inches. Um, climbing bars is what I think they're called uh, by Ergo or Ergon. Love them. Anyway, my point is that bikes should really be utilitarian. They should be utilitarian. They should be something that allows people to get things done. Um, the author says that in the Netherlands, you don't really have this category of people that are, quote, cyclists. Uh, because everybody is a cyclist. They all just use bikes. Um, whereas in, in, in the U.S., it's very common to see somebody who's very clearly a cyclist. They've got the, the spandex on, you know, the fancy jerseys. They've got a road bike. That looks like it costs like five thousand dollars. You know, they're they they're like clearly in shape. Look like they could probably ride from Seattle to Portland, which is a popular ride apparently. And uh, yeah, I mean, part of the problem with that though, <clears throat> I mean, it's great. Somebody wants to bike for sport. Uh, I fully support that. But the problem is that people who aren't cyclists can't re they can't really see themselves in in that elite cyclist sort of uh shoes right if you see the person who's who's like so far different because they're just like a they're like a tour de france type cyclist right it's really hard to imagine yourself biking to work or or biking if that's the model of a cyclist that you have Instead, if you have people who are just wearing everyday clothes, who are in all kinds of physical shape and they're biking and they're getting around, it's a lot easier for people to think, oh, I can see myself on that bike. I can see myself getting rid of my car. I can see myself maybe not driving into work because look, that guy, he looks just like me and he seems to be making it work. So I kind of like this whole idea. I I almost wanted to get a Dutch bike. I, I thought, gosh, I should trade in my current bike and get like more of a Dutch bike. They're, they're really not that common here. Um, most of the bikes that I see are like gravel bikes now, uh, in the shops, but I'm pretty happy with mine. Uh, and I like the idea of just like fixing it and so on rather than upgrading. <laughs> All right. The author concludes, he says, the end result of all this cycling um, infrastructure and success and adoption in, in the Netherlands is that cycling becomes remarkably unremarkable. So it's a paradox. It's remarkable in the sense that, hey, you've gotten a, a majority, majority of the population in many cities riding their bikes everywhere instead of driving. And you've somehow won over uh, your infrastructure to have so much primary pathage uh, devoted to cycling. I don't know what the right term is. You've got a lot of cycling um, paths and options and roads and, and um, other features in your, in your country, and you've made so much progress. It's remarkable. But for the people living there, they just think it's normal. It's like, um, for example, kids who go to school mostly ride their bike. Whereas in the U.S., uh, kids who ride their bike to school are like a small fraction, <laughs> much probably probably like five to ten percent of students. Um, whereas in the Netherlands, apparently, if you don't ride your bike to school, it would be weird to be dropped off by a car or like take public transportation to school. It'd be unheard of. At least according to the author, I've never been to. Um, the Netherlands, but for, for most of the people there, it's unremarkable, right? It's just the way it is. Cycling is normalized. Um, it's, it's, it's nothing that is remarkable to them. And that's pretty much uh, all my takeaways there. Um, if you have any thoughts, I'd be, uh, I'd love to hear them. 
Again, the book is Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. You know, I didn't really talk much about about the vitality, but obviously there's a strong exercise component uh, in that. One small detail I didn't mention is is that, um, you know, vitality refers to kind of a mental health, a positive state of mental health, a happiness, being in, you know, good physical condition and so on. And a lot of this comes from, from biking. Um, I have a couple of kids just last summer who were learning to drive. One of them got her license. I mean, she learned to drive and she picked it up pretty fast and she became a very competent driver. But the other one really didn't take to driving. She, uh, they didn't like driving. They, they really preferred to bike. And they actually learned to ride their bike everywhere and get around and navigate the city and, and understand the rules of the road and figure out the right you know, dress and equipment and, and how to just get around on your bike. And I thought that is also commendable. Like it's hard to figure all that out and to make biking work for you. And the author says that, that when youth have this, um, autonomy and independence from biking and they're not kind of subject to helicopter parents and constant monitoring, but have some, you know, autonomy and, and freedom, it really adds to their mental health, which comes back to the the comment about urban vitality. So I definitely think there's a mental health component that, that is a benefit from cycling as well. All right, that's it. Uh, let me know if you have any feedback. Again, my site is I'd rather be My name is Tom Johnson. Thanks for listening.